Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this Show Us Your Portfolio episode, we sit down with Rick Ferry, author, investment advisor, and founder of Ferry Investment Solutions, and the creator of the Core 4 Investing Method. We talk to Rick about simple, low-cost investing and how for many investors this can be a rewarding, long-term approach to successfully building wealth. We look into Rick's own portfolio, which captures the essence of a more passive, lower-cost, and longer-term approach to investing. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Rick Ferry. Hi, Rick. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We're going to um, have you on today to share uh, more about your investment philosophy, talk about how you invest your personal portfolio, how you think about long-term successful investing, and actually how you advise clients. But I wanted to start on two interesting things about your background, and I'm going a little bit far back here, but I, I want you to comment on both of these. The first is I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, and when you were at Solomon Smith Barty in the 90s, you were one of the first, and I just find this interesting, registered reps to actually get his CFA. And I, I thought that was an interesting little fun fact about you because I imagine that was like the brokerage days where I don't think a C, you know, the CFA designation really mattered that much, but you were sort of on the f- forefront of understanding why it was important, I think. Well, I wanted to learn uh, it. And I had asked around to the money managers uh, and the analysts, they all seem to be getting this thing called a CFA, Charter Financial Analyst Charter. And uh, I, a- I asked about it and I decided, well, I, you know, if they have it, it's probably something I should get if I really want to understand this business. So I began, I want to say, in 1992. And, uh, you know, it's a three-year program. I, I had been in the brokerage industry for about three years at that point. So I started in 92 and I took the first exam and passed and second exam and passed and a uh, third exam and passed. So I passed uh, all three exams, one, one two, three. And uh, it was a, a very intensive program. I have found one other person in the brokerage industry that had a charter financial analyst. A- so degree, or not degree, but a charter uh, at that time and was working as a broker. I know it's probably much more now, but back then, you're right. It, it was not something that advisors or brokers uh, did, but it, it, I, thought it, I thought it was excellent, the whole program. Speaking of intensity, uh, we were talking about your experience as a uh, aircraft carrier fighter pilot. And... and... And then the intensity of those, of, of those landings and being able to, to nail that, uh, on the deck. So I don't know if you, that was kind of cool. We were talking about before, so something that maybe you could share. Well, it really did form my investment beliefs. I, I know it's hard to make the connection, but let me make it for you. If, if you screw up coming aboard a carrier, you die. <laughs> it's simple as that. You die. So you had to be very precise. And sometimes the instruments lied to you. And sometimes the people who were controlling you as you came coming aboard the ship, I'm talking about the people in the tower, not, not the LSOs, but the, the ones who were giving you directions. Sometimes they actually lie to you. I'm not lie to you intentionally, but I mean, you had to know what the truth was and what was trying to fake you out or what was not telling you the truth. We always had backup instruments. Sometimes we had three backup instruments. And sometimes you had to go to that third instrument to figure out, you know, am I straight and level or not? If you're in the goo, you know, the clouds or it's at nighttime. I mean, it, it being accurate and being truthful about the way the world actually was and the way the plane was actually oriented, uh, kept you alive. And then coming aboard the ship, you had to be absolutely precise in everything you did. There was no, oh, that's good enough. 
you know, good enough for government work type stuff. That wasn't the way it was. You had to, you had to nail it, as you said. And, um, well, that was my mentality uh, and everything I did. And you remember, I, I, I dropped bombs and shot missiles and did you had to hit the target. If you'd hit the target, people's lives on the ground were saved. Um, so you had to be accurate. I mean, it was just no question about it. And everybody was that way. That's why we all thought there was no lying going on. Well, now in 1988, I leave the, that environment and I go into Wall Street where everything is a lie. I mean, you know, how do you figure out what the truth is when 99% of the people are lying to you? And, uh, well, I had to figure out what the truth was. I, I really needed to know that. And I think that is in part what led me to the CFA program and all the study that I did was I wanted to know what is true and what is not. And, uh, and I think I did find that out over time. Well, I will say as a pilot who, uh, did some flight training, you know, when, when I had to land a Cessna on a 4,000 foot runway, I struggled with that. So I can only imagine how hard it was to do what you did. Well, at daytime, it wasn't too bad after a while, but at nighttime, you really never get used to it, especially when the weather's bad and the ship is doing all kinds of things. Uh, it, it does, you know, you're just glad to be on deck at night. Yeah. <laughs> so we've done, um, over 150 podcast episodes, but this show us your portfolio concept is relatively new. And we've had a few prior guests on that have talked about their sort of personal approach to investing and. Those conversations um, have been much more sort of complex in nature in terms of how they go about managing their personal portfolio. And I, I think based on what I know about you, you know, today's discussion, um, it will be very different than that. Um, and it will kind of try to get at why it will be different with maybe more simplicity and the things that you've spent, you know, your career sort of trying to educate investors about and working with um, clients on. But I wanted to sort of start with you is how do you look at your personal portfolio? And when you think about your long-term goals, what are you trying to achieve? Um, when you think about managing your personal assets? Okay. So let's start out with, you know, who I am, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I am, I'm going to be 65 and I've already made my money. I don't really need to make any more money. Okay. So, uh, and when it comes to living off that money, I'm not planning on living off any of it for another five years because I plan to continue advising and, uh, selling books and whatnot, but that's, that's what I'll, you know, I'll make my money. When I do hit 70, I'll pick up social security. I have a military pension. I have a couple of pensions, a small one from Smith Barney, a small one from Citigroup. Um, I'm skipping that city group, uh, uh, Smith Barney and, uh, GE, believe it or not, because I worked for Kidder Peabody and, you know, my investment portfolio only needs to generate nothing, zero. I mean, I don't honestly, with my social security, my military pension, the other small pensions I have book royalties that I'm getting, uh, you know, it, the money, most of it's going to go to my kids. Don't tell them that, but that that's where it's going to go. Uh, so, okay. So I just wanted to frame where I'm at financially because it's important. Okay. So my portfolio at the moment is about 65% in equity and 35% in fixed income, which includes about a 5% cash position. I would like over time to see that increase to potentially 80% equity. I know why, why isn't it there right now? It's because most of my money that I made was from the sale of my business, which happened a few years ago. And I have, but just gradually over time, investing the money, I'm in no rush to get it up to that 80%. Oh, my kids need to borrow some money to buy a house. And, you know, I gave some gifts out this and that. So the other things I was doing with the money as well. So. Call it 65% equity. That's, that's where I'm at. Um, and 35% fixed income, which includes a cash position. So why don't you then take it from there and ask me questions about that? Well, I mean, I think first of all, the fact what, what you did in terms of framing it up about your specific situation is very important because I think, you know, anyone listening to this 
is going to be in a different situation than you. Maybe some people might be in a somewhat similar situation, but so I think that's the important thing when I guess working with investors and you know, this probably better than anyone. It's, you know, no two investors are exactly alike. Some people will need a return off their portfolio. They may need a four or 5% return because they're living off of it. You know, you're in a different, I guess, situation, um, than that, because it's like you said, you have these other income streams coming in and the portfolio is just there. Maybe you spend a little of that. Maybe most of it goes to your kids, but it's, uh, you know, it's different for a lot of different people, basically is the bottom line. So the, I guess the question, um, from there is when you mentioned retirement, but let me just kind of ask you, cause we'll kind of get into some of these allocation percentages, um, in a moment here, but with retirement, when you envision your retirement, what do you, you said you're going to plan on still working and writing and educating, working with clients, you'll have the opportunity to, but you know, when you, when you think about yourself in your mid seventies, what do you think of yourself doing? Is it still doing the same thing or do you envision a slightly different retirement for yourself, maybe a decade from now? Well, I already, I, I've been a meticulous planner my whole life. I mean, I, I kind of planned out every single decade going forward. So, you know, between now and 70, I want to continue to do what I've been doing right now. I'm you know, working with clients and so forth. I do take summers off. I don't meet with clients during the summer, just in the winter. So I'm sort of semi-retired there. But at age 70, I just don't want to deal with SEC regulations and all this other stuff about running a investment management company. I'm just, I'm done with it. So that will end. Now, I, I'll still help advisors. I do have a side business helping advisors. So I still will advise advisors and like I said, write books and I'll still have some income coming in from there. But um, I plan to uh, do more travel. I plan to do more writing. I like to update all of my books. And you know, when John Bogle, when John Bogle retired from uh, Vanguard, he didn't really retire, right? I mean, he just went into a, a separate office. He switched offices and then he, he started writing more. And I think that's what, you know, I would probably do. It, if it leads to revenue, great. If it doesn't, great, but that's it. And then there's the old travel thing, you know, play with the grandkids. Kids will be older by then. So, and I play a lot of pickleball too, by the way. I'm a, a pretty good pickleball player. My, my rating is four or five. I don't know if you know what that means, but uh, I'm a pretty highly rated pickleball player. So I have a lot of things, uh, you know, that I would do, but you know, don't, don't think of it as anything more than a, you know, a typical retirement that uh, there's nothing special going on with me, I guess, over anybody else. My parents are actually big pickleball players as well. Every time I go out to visit, they've tried to get me to play. I, I haven't yet, but I, I've been told it's a lot of fun. Um, I want to pick up on the, something you said at the beginning about sort of not needing your money for a very long time. How do you think about your time frame, your portfolio in that context? I mean, do you look at it as sort of an infinite, like long time frame because you just intend to give the money to your kids when you think about building your portfolio? My, my time frame when I buy an investment is the rest of my life. Uh, that's my time frame. So, you know, Warren Buffett said, uh, you know, buy a, and it, but whatever you buy, uh, make believe the market's going to close for five years. And uh, you'll still be happy owning it at five years later. Well, I've extended that to basically the rest of my life. I mean, that what I buy, I don't have any reason to ever sell um, because they are good, solid, low cost, tax efficient, diversified, mostly index funds. So, and if I sold them, I'd have to pay capital gain taxes, at least in my taxable account. And so I don't plan on selling them. Now, obviously when I do required minimum distributions in my retirement account, I will have to sell, but that's a little different story. I mean, I don't have any choice, but um, no, my, my investments are not trades. They're lifelong holdings. And I don't know how different that is from your other guests, but that's the way I look at my portfolio. Okay. And I think most of our guests were, were very long-term investors. They were obviously getting there in a very different way, but I think they were, you know, focusing on the long-term. Um, I want to ask you about this idea of simplicity in a portfolio. You know, as Justin mentioned, our, our first three guests had fairly complex portfolios and you actually had a pretty funny comment on Twitter when we had Wes on, um, you said something about like, good luck to your wife trying to unwind all that stuff, talking about all his managed futures contracts. Yeah, exactly. Um, in there. So I'm wondering if you could just talk at a high level about the benefits of having a very simple investment approach. Well, the benefits, uh, well, tell me what the disadvantages are. <laughs> yeah, I don't know it. I don't know any disadvantage. Um, the benefits are, um, 
as you've been in this business for three, four decades, you begin to realize that, you know, if all I did was get the market return, that, that was it. Uh, stock market return, the bond market return. That's all I did. I'd actually be better off financially than I am today. And that's true for me. And it's true for most people. The minimum amount of trading you do, the better off you are. So, uh, but both from a, a you know, behavioral mistake standpoint and also a tax standpoint. So starting from that premise, you know, how do you make your portfolio that way? Uh, what's the simplest way of doing it? And the answer is, well, you buy a total stock market index fund and a total international index fund and a couple of bond index funds and you're done. Uh, don't really have to do much of anything else. It's just what allocation between those funds are you going to have? And you hold on to it for the rest of your life. Um, you're going to outperform at least 97% of all other investors doing that. Uh, and I, I, maybe I could get that. Maybe I could be in that other 3%, but I don't think so. I don't think so. And it's not worth it for me to try because if I'm going to be in the you know, 90th percentile, as far as best returns, you know, top percentile, oh, that's good enough for me. I mean, when we were coming aboard the carrier, we didn't have to be absolutely perfectly on center line. You had to be very, very, very close, but you were going to, you were going to live if you were a foot one way or the other. <laughs> it's the same thing here. I'm not trying to be number one. I'm trying to be in the top 10 and I can get there with just a simple portfolio of a few good index funds. So why not? It's. It's almost a guarantee. I say almost because I can't ever use the word guarantee, but it's almost a guarantee you're going to be there. Why do you think when, when simplicity works so well, why do you think all of us want complexity? Like I know in my portfolio, I tend to do things that are too complex. And then you, you talk on Twitter a lot about how when you get a portfolio from another advisor, there's always like 27 mutual funds in there that could have been accomplished with a lot less. Like why do we all want complexity in this process that could just be a simple process? Well, there's a lot of uh, answers. I if you're working with an advisor, there's one answer to that question. If you're doing it on your own, there's another answer to that question. So which one would you like first? Maybe, maybe the advisor went first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. This is changing by the way, which is good. It's changing for the better. It's coming slowly, but it's changing. Advisors view complexity as a form of job security. If all an advisor did was to get paid a 1% asset under management fee to put a client in a total stock market index fund, a total bond fund, and a total international fund, whether it's true or not, the advisor is going to feel as though, hey, the client's going to catch on to this and I'm going to get fired because the client is going to say, you know, I don't know why I need you. You don't trade the portfolio. You just got these three simple funds. I understand it. And what do I need you for? Goodbye. That's what the advisors are afraid of. So, and when I work with advisors, and a lot of times I get hired to help them create model portfolios, the first thing I ask them is, okay, how many funds do you want in the portfolio? And they go, yeah, well, at least eight, at least eight. Um, but probably no more than 12. I mean, literally, that's what they tell me. And I'm going, well, why at least eight? Well, you know, it's got to be, you know, somewhat complicated so that, you know, the client thinks I'm doing something. And I fully understand that. So, okay, that's why I create the portfolio that has eight funds, nine funds, 10 funds. It does the same thing as a three fund portfolio, but it's more complicated. So from an advisor standpoint, point, complexity is job security. And I'll leave it at that. Now, you want to go to the individual investor? Yeah, but just quickly to, to your point on that, you know, it's interesting because there's some, there's some ETFs out there now that'll actually do the total asset allocation and sort of change it over time in the ETF, you know, from a tax efficiency standpoint. And, you know, I was talking to an advisor the other day, like, you know, wouldn't it make sense to use that? Because, you know, you're getting tax efficiency, it's getting asset allocation done. They're like, there's no way I could possibly use that. My clients would never stay with me if they look, went in and saw one fund in their portfolio. Now, there's nothing wrong with this advisor, probably. Probably a very smart person. 
well-educated. They just need to change their fee model. That's all. And that is changing. Like I said, the world is changing. I mean, the advisors are finally coming around to the idea that they should be selling their knowledge instead of selling complexity. And once you start selling your knowledge and you get paid based on a retainer, uh, your subscription fee, an hourly fee, or something along the lines that's not tied to the portfolio, then it makes this decision much easier to say, hey, now I'm no longer being judged based on the performance of the portfolio. I can actually do what's in the best interest of the client. And that is to be simple. So we are seeing a slow gradual shift to that. And, you know, even people like Michael Kitsis are, are realizing that and writing about it more and talking about it more. And so there's, there's, there's a group out there and I think it's just growing. And how about the answer on uh, why individuals want complexity? I mean, can you, can you coach me here and get me to stop tinkering with my portfolio and putting all these complex things in there? Because you want to outperform the market and, and that's, and you think you, you have the brain power to do it. And so you try all these things, even with indexing, you start out with simple indexing, but then you go to factor investing and, you know, we'll start some momentum strategy and, you know, you do the West gray thing. <laughs> Sorry, Wes, if you're listening to this, uh, you know, and, and the idea is you, you start adding all this complexity to your portfolio. You just think somehow, some way it's going to optimize the portfolio and you're going to be optimized for all these different risks and you keep tinkering with it and changing it and, you know, doing different allocations, all this stuff in it. And eventually what happens is you, at the individual investor will eventually, if they're smart, they'll say enough of this already. Let's just go back to the good old Jack Bogle simplicity. And, and that's what individuals tend to do after a while. Yeah, well, I probably need, I probably need to learn that myself. <laughs> Before we talk more about, I want to talk about your core four approach to investing, but before we do that, I, I want to ask you about a quote you put on Twitter the other day, because I thought it was really interesting. Um, and, and it kind of relates to our relationship with money and how it relates to our portfolio and also how it relates to money in everyday life. And, and your quote was humans and money. It's a weird relationship. My wife was thrilled to find a $20 bill while hiking. We spent an hour talking about how she was going to enjoy spending it. On the same day, our investment portfolio gained tens of thousands of dollars and never entered the conversation. So what do you think that tells us about sort of our relationship with money and how, what we think about our portfolio versus money in everyday life? Well, it, 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 money is a foreign object to human beings. You know, we human beings <clears throat> have been around for, I don't know, a hundred thousand years, depending who you talk with, whatever, whatever scientists you're talking with, but the, uh, money, you know, is is something that is relatively new. This idea of saving money now, putting it away and spending it 20 years from now. I mean, how foreign is that to our DNA? I mean, we're hunter gatherers, right? <laughs> we're going to go out, kill something and eat it. Maybe we'll gather some nuts, maybe last us over the winter, but that's about as far as it goes. This whole concept of money. It's all very new to human beings. It's not in our blood yet. And I, I think that this story about the 20 bucks kind of emphasizes that because um, it it was nothing. I mean, it's it, 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 it just that, you know, a lot of people gave, gave their explanation of why, you know, what was going on there. And somebody said, we should ask Morgan Housel. He'll probably be able to say what's going on. And I don't think he ever chimed in. But the, the point is that... Um, humans are not good with money. We have to learn this and it's difficult. And I thought if I just did that, I just put that up there as an example of how difficult it is for human beings to actually come to terms with what money is, saving, investing, and all of that. And that, uh, look how, th how things can get so kind of bass backwards in your head when you find 20 bucks and you spend a lot of time thinking about how to spend it. In the meantime, your investment portfolio gains enough money for you to live for the whole year. <laughs> so anyway. Shifting back to your portfolio, you have a really interesting concept with, the, with your idea of the core four approach. And I believe, is, is it core-four.com? Is that the uh, address for the portfolios? C-O-R-E-number-four.com. And okay, so what was this? It was simply, let's come up with some simple portfolios. And the, the first one was very simple. The first one I ever did, it was total stock market total international stock, total bond, and tips. 
And the reason why tips were included was because tips were not, are not in the total bond market and it gives you a little inflation hedge. So that was the original, original core four. And then I said, well, maybe we should add some real estate because, uh, something like 13 to 15% of national income is rental income, but it's not reflected in the stock market. So if we want our portfolio to look more like the economy than the stock market, then we need to add more real estate. So I, I took the tips out and I put real estate in and I said, okay, total stock, total international real estate and total bond. And that was the next score for, and then the, and then I said, well, what are we missing out of this? Well, what we're missing is private equity. Well, you can't just go out and buy private equity, but what emulates private equity the best of all the sectors of the stock market that emulate the return of private equity, it ends up being small cap value. In fact, Wes Gray wrote a paper on this, but I had talked about it years ago. Small cap value kind of emulates private equity in return. So let's create a core four portfolio that was total global equity, because I only want four funds. That's the idea. I'm just going to do this whole thing with four funds, global equity, a world equity, and Vanguard has a world equity ETF, real estate, because real estate is a big part of the economy, small cap value, because that emulates that portion of the economy that we can't get in the stock market because it's private equity, and then total bond. And th so my idea with this core four is no matter what strategy you come up with, I, I can create a four fund portfolio somehow, some way that'll do what it is you want to do, but only do it with four funds and that's it, just four. And uh, so far, so good. I think I've been able to do that. And I created a website that said, okay, if you want to do ESG using four funds, this is how you do it. If you want a high yielding portfolio with four funds, this is how you do it. And, and that's how I, I came up with that idea. But it's free. I mean, people can go and take a look at it. And, you know, I believe that the real, the driver of re investment return, 90% of it is your allocation between equity and fixed income. That's, that's 90% of the variability of return. But I think actually it's 90% of what you're going to get. So these little things about whether you're dividing it between small value and total market or some real estate and all that are very minor. But if this is what keeps you in the portfolio, if this is what you believe, and you invest this way and it's going to keep you invested for the very long term, then, then do it as long as it keeps you invested. So that, that's how the core four came about. And I, I created this website and I put everything up there and I said, here you go. I hope this helps. And, and I would think to your point, I think the key probably for a lot of people would be figuring out sort of which core four por portfolio makes sense for them or a combination of them and sticking with it because you get someone like me in there, I'm going to be like, oh, no, there's inflation. So I need to go move over to the inflation one. And then I'm going to, you know, I'll start tinkering with it and messing it up. So probably allocating it to the long term, like you said, is probably the key there. Yeah, it's difficult because just like you said, I mean, investing is uh, difficult. People make it much, much harder than it needs to be because they don't come up with a simple strategy that they can stick with for the very long term. They're always tinkering with it. And if you look at the performance of what you've done by tinkering with it on and on and on and on and on, you slap yourself across the side of the head eventually and you say, what am I doing? I mean, why am I doing this to myself? I, I just buy a couple of good total market index funds and be done with the whole thing and spend more time with my family, you know, doing things I enjoy rather than frustrating myself to death with all of this. I was going to ask you separate questions about equities and bonds, but I think for you, I could probably roll them into one question. What do you think about this idea of expected returns? So, you know, a lot of the quant types like us are saying, all right, you know, the expected returns on bonds are really low. So you might want to have less bonds or the expect equities are expensive and the expected returns are really low. So you might want to have less equities. I mean, how do you think about that? Is there, is there a case to be made that when expected returns are low, you should be making changes to your portfolio? Or do you think most people should just be looking at this as I'm, I'm in it for the long term? If equities are expensive, it'll eventually work itself out. Well, it's interesting you bring this up because my next podcast, my next podcast guest is, uh, Auntie Ilmanen from AQR. And uh, we're going to be talking about his first book, Expected Returns. And then, uh, his second book, which talks about, uh, expected returns that are low return environment. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but that's, that's what we're going to be talking about. So 
you know, I've read both of his books and I know him personally. And we um, conversed a little bit uh, on email preparing for this podcast. And with a lot of things interesting, I think that Cliff Asnes kind of said it best. He said, you know, in this low returning environment or low expected return environment, you have three choices. Choice number one is you could take more risk. You could decide instead of being 65% equity, I'm going to be 90% equity or 80% equity. But you got to be able to handle that risk. You can't capitulate in the middle of it. It's not a market timing thing. It's a very long-term thing. And you've got to accept higher volatility. The second thing you could do is add some things that don't look very expensive, like value versus growth. So you start doing some factor investing, some other type of investing that Auntie put in his uh, book. It's a lot of institutional stuff, but you're trying to get a excess returns from the stuff that doesn't look expensive, um, adding that to your portfolio. But again, you're really now complicating up a portfolio for an individual investor. And that can lead to capitulation from that strategy when it doesn't work. A lot of people bought into small cap value investing 10 years ago. And uh, a lot of people who did that 10 years ago are now out of it now, having missed the opportunity just to be in the total market the entire time. So you can't risk that. And the third thing is uh, what Cliff said, he called it the Jack Bogle portfolio. Hey, just accept what you have and stay the course. Stay the course. And I think that's the most logical thing for an individual investor. We are going to be in a lower returning environment. Why? Because interest rates fell over the last 40 years from something like 18% down to 2%. And that caused the valuation of everything, real estate, stocks, bonds, everything to go up. Well, that's over now. It's finished. The next 40 years are not going to be like the last 40 years. The baby boomers had it really, really well, my generation. And investment advisors who had their businesses during this period of time did very, very well. Not because they were brilliant, but, you know, it's better to be lucky than good. I mean, they caught a very good market. And so we're okay. We should be okay. It's the next generation that I think needs to seriously think about what asset allocation they're going to have get invested in a very low cost way, be super tax efficient, super simple about how they do it and stay the course. And uh, they'll get a decent rate of return, but it won't be the rate of return that we've seen over the last 40 years. It's just not going to be there. Yeah. To, to your point about factors, you know, that's something we struggle with a lot because we, we run factor portfolios, but we often will tell investors to invest in index funds. And the reason we'll do it is because just an experience doing this, talking about that decade where small cap value struggled. I mean, it's a minority of investors that can sit there and struggle for that period of time and not abandon a strategy. And, th and those strategies are useless to you. If, you. if you abandon them at the wrong time, they're useless to you. You might as well be an index fund. So that's, that's always a tough balance. Well, they're, they're worse than useless. It's worse than useless. I mean, if you get into small cap value and you abandon it, you've missed the opportunity cost of just being in the total market. Value invest, small cap value investing, factor investing is a lifelong investment strategy. I have a position in small cap value. I do not ever intend on selling it. It would be foolish for me to sell it. it it's something that it's part of my portfolio. I have in my portfolio is this total economy portfolio. I have total stock. Uh, total internationals or, or global equity allocation. I have a real estate allocation and REITs and an index fund. And then I have a small cap value index fund. That's, that's my equity portfolio. And, uh, but it's, I have seen no reason whatsoever to ever, ever change that, nor do I want to, because I know if I did, it would probably be at the wrong time. And, I'd probably be hurting myself. So if you go into this factor investing and there's nothing wrong with it, I mean, you know, there's compelling evidence and I hate, hate to use that word, but I know a lot of people like to use evidence-based investing and I hate that, but that's okay. Uh, uh, that it might generate an excess return because you're investing in a riskier 
stocks. There's the market is discounting the valuation of these companies because they see more risk there, whatever the risk may be. And you're buying a whole basket of these. And therefore, conceptually, you should get a higher return because you're taking more risk. So, but yet it could be 25 years down the road. And that's how long you have to stick with it. Like Wes Gray and I had this discussion and I think uh, I originally said, oh, well, Wes, I think you got to stay in this for 20 years. And he said, no, it's 25. So I'll, I'll believe him. Let's just go with 25. <laughs> you mentioned all the asset classes you invest in. I want to ask you about rebalancing. Because that's, that's something a lot of investors can struggle with. You know, some people will say I do it on a specific date every year. Some people have bands, you know, if it gets too far from its target, I'll bring it back in. But I mean, how do you think about rebalancing when you manage your personal portfolio? Well, first cash, I mean, you know, rebalancing with cash. So the portfolio generates cash. And that cash uh, can be used to rebalance. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, you know, I'm investing money every year. I'm, I'm making money in my business and I put money into my retirement plan. So I can put, you know, I can use that for rebalancing. So that's number two. So obviously cash is the way to go. And after that, it's really questionable whether I really want to rebalance, you know, after that. Uh, it's probably something I'm never going to do rebalance. You know, I said I wanted to get my portfolio from 65 up to 80% equity, and that may actually occur over the next 20 years because I never rebalance. Uh, but um, I think rebalance is overrated, even though I write about it in my books and so forth. I think it's just overrated. And I think it's another thing that advisors do to justify their fees when it may not be really that necessary, at least not that often. What, every two years, every three years, every five years, maybe? You could look at that and say, yeah, maybe I should do some rebalancing. Now, I will say if you could do tax loss harvesting and rebalancing at the same time, that, okay, that, that might make sense because you can get a tax benefit from doing it in a taxable portfolio. But I've been kind of poo-pooing, you know, systematic rebalancing for, for a little probably the last 10 years, I think. And I, and I, I just not, I mean, it's, it, there's other ways of doing it. And look, when you start doing RMDs uh, from a portfolio, when you're retired, if your equities are too high and you have equity in your retirement account, you could sell the equity and keep the bonds. I mean, there's other ways of doing it uh, than actually going in and doing a systematic rebalancing. It's actually, it's actually an interesting idea you have in terms of you're trying to get your equity allocation up over time. So let's let that natural drift sort of get me to where I want to go, because that's something you see with more investors than you think, because a lot of investors can actually take risk later in retirement more than they can early in retirement. So this idea of like letting that naturally happen, that's actually a very interesting way to do it. It's called a reverse glide path. Uh, and there was a paper written up about it by, uh, Wade Fowl and Michael Kitsis. And, uh, and they put a name on it, called it a reverse glide path. It's basically, you start out with your allocation in retirement. That's about the most conservative allocation you're going to have, whatever it is, 50, 50, 40, 60, you know, stocks to bonds. And then you never, never rebalance after that. And it's actually a better liability matching method than doing rebalancing because as your equities grow, uh, it actually matches the liability, long-term liabilities that you have better than doing a, uh, you know, rebalancing certainly matches them a lot better than things like your age and bonds and these rules of thumb that really don't fit anybody. Um, I know you, you were saying earlier that, you know, that no two people have an identical portfolio and, and that's true because no two people are identical on average, you get to this average, right? But I've never met an average investor. <laughs> I've got clients who are 90 years old and have, would never think about buying a bond. And I had client, one client who was 30 years old, sold his software company, never wanted to buy an equity. So, uh, it, it, you know, this idea of age and bonds and using these cliches is okay. But in reality, when you're talking with clients one-on-one, -on -one, the way that advisors really make their money is to figure out what is it exactly that you need? And, uh, and provide to them or help them put a portfolio together or what they actually need rather than what some computer program says because you filled out a risk tolerance questionnaire. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, it's 
It's interesting to me too, you know, as people, you mentioned the person who had a lot of money, but didn't want any equities. I think that's the way I'd be too. Like if I've, if I've set myself up for life, I'm not sure that I really would want to be taking risks. That's perfectly reasonable, perfectly logical. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's other people that have long, that are really rich and have long-term time horizons where they want to pass it on for generations. And they're hundred percent equities because they just don't care. And they have a very, very long time frame. So, you know, it is really the same, the same facts can lead to very, very different outcomes and different people. Um, I just want to ask you one more before I switch it back to Justin. I want to ask you about inflation because it's what everybody's talking about right now. And I, I know you had a core four portfolio for inflation, but did you do anything or, or do you think you need to do anything in your portfolio to handle inflation? You know, you kind of have one camp of people that say, all right, the 40 year run is over. Inflation's coming. We need, all of us need to make changes to our long-term allocations. And then you have other people who say, well, if you had a good long-term allocation in the first place, you don't really need to do anything. So I'm wondering where you fall on that when you, when you think about your own portfolio. Well, remember I lived through the 1970s inflation, right? I mean, I, I remember the death of equity uh, cover on Business Week. And uh, I was in college at the time. Uh, it's the Fed's dire goal to bring inflation down. How are they going to do it? They, inflation is horrible for the economy. Terrible. Um, so let's just assume they are able to do their job over time. Not, maybe not right away, but over time, they're able to bring inflation down to, let's call it their target of 2%, okay? Very difficult, but let's assume that they do. Then is my portfolio set up now for that future? The answer is yes. I, I don't need to do anything to it. I will say that over the last couple of years, I have been buying my $30,000 worth of I-bonds. I say 30,000 because I can buy 10 and my wife can buy 10 and then my company can buy 10. So we can buy $30,000 a year of I-bonds and I have been doing that. And, uh, and, that, and that's just a cash substitute actually uh, as part of my fixed income portfolio. But that's about the only thing I've done differently in this higher inflation environment. Rick, I wanted to ask, so how often do you actually look at your portfolio? I mean, on the one hand, I'm thinking you're looking at it maybe once a year, but it could be once every three years. Oh, heck no. I, I probably look at my portfolio 25 times a day. Are you kidding? Okay. <laughs> so you are in there looking at it. I, it, it doesn't make any, it, it does, it doesn't make any difference actually. I mean, I, look, I'm, I'm on the Vanguard website cause I'm working with clients all the time and, and I just I, it, my portfolio comes up when I log on. So, I mean, I'm looking at it all the time. I, it, and I watch it go up and down and okay. I know, but if I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not like I'm going to do anything. In other words, I, it, I, I've been through a few bear markets, so I'm not going to do anything if I see it go down. And of course, you know, I still have the same feelings. Oh, I wish I sold everything last November, hundred percent cash. And then I would have bought again, you know, a couple of months ago after the market bottomed out, whatever day that was. And boy, look how much money I would have made. Yeah, well, that's kind of ridiculous, but we all think about it. And I mean, I think about that stuff, you know, all the time too. You know, what if I would have bought Google on the day it, it came public? How much money would I have today? Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. You know, it's just what if, what if, what if. I'm not going to do that because uh, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We hope. The global economy continues to grow in real terms. We hope that inflation comes down below borrowing costs eventually. But uh, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, I don't even know if those things are going to happen. But I'm that, that's my bet. My bet is that inflation does come down, and then my fixed income portfolio will actually give me a real return uh, again. And my bet is that. Uh, global GDP, real global GDP will grow, and this will cause real global earnings to grow, and this will cause dividends to increase in my stock portfolio to grow. And th those are the only two assumptions that I make, and I think that the second assumption is more solid than the first one about inflation. <laughs> I'm I'm shifting a little here, but when you work with clients. You're basically, um, you know, not ma not managing their portfolios for them. You're kind of giving them a roadmap. Or you're giving them 
allocation into different ETFs based on the core portfolio or the, the, the other portfolios that you, that you run. Some are free on your website. Some are through this, but, but, but where I wanted, what I want to ask you is how do you like the one benefit I see of working with a financial advisor, hopefully is that during periods of, you know, market stress or when investors, when investors get worried, my phone rings a lot more. And so what I try to do is add most of the value I can, I think during those periods, cause you want to help people sort of make it through. So how do you, or what would you say to, to someone that's implementing the portfolio themselves? How do they become disciplined, committed, and sort of have a steadfast belief in the underlying strategy, especially during those darkest moments, like in the worst of the, you know, in the bottom of the bear market? Uh, I, I don't have any control at all over that. Uh, I give them the path. I, I say, look, let's structure the portfolio this way. And it's not, it's not according to the core four, really. I mean, what, what it is, is a lot of people have 401k plans and they don't have access, excuse me, they don't have access to these uh, funds. So we got to work around it. A lot of them have legacy securities. You now, Justin was saying that, I'm sorry, Jack was saying that when we first, uh, started that, uh, you know, people come to you with all these different things and they have, uh, a lot of stuff in their portfolio. We got to work around that. we can't just sell everything, take big tax gains. You got to work around this stuff. So, you know, the concept of simplicity is that's the goal. I mean, that's what the ideal kind of the North star direction that we want to take with their portfolio, but you know, whether we actually get there or not is very difficult to say. It's just a case by case basis. Now, then once we come up with the plan and I give it to them in writing here, go do this. I have no control or even idea whether or not they actually do it. I don't know. This is one of the, I guess, disadvantages of not managing their money, but that's the way this works. I mean, they're paying me, I'm giving them the plan. If they don't implement it, they don't implement it. But, and, I, and I'll never know whether they do or not unless they contact me again. And if they do contact me again, then I just charge them an hourly fee. Um, and I say to them, you know, if you're having problems doing this, contact me. Or if you have questions, contact me. Or if you get nervous, contact me. Or if something changes, contact me. And they do. I mean, you know, not everybody, but, you know, they, they do. And we spend sometimes only 15 minutes and I charge them $90 <laughs> for that 15 minutes to kind of set them straight or just make sure if everything's going well, or maybe they didn't get it implemented, but they're working on it. And so we work, you know, we spend some time going over what they need to do, or how, how far along they are. Uh, it's, it's different than, you know, managing people's portfolio where I had discretion and I had control, uh, working with people who are doing it themselves. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I, I do get a few more inquiries when markets are down. Not that many, not that many more. Maybe they're just blowing me off. I, I don't know. <laughs> Go, going back to your, your wife for a second, does she well, maybe let me frame it up this way. When you are working with investors, do you tend to work with husband and wives or have you seen any, um, evidence? Like, I'm wondering, like, and this is maybe, I don't know if this is, this could be completely like off. I'm wondering if when couples work on their investment strategies together, if there's more, there's more people thinking about things, there's more collaboration, potentially there's more long-term success than it's just one person or the other. Like in my household, my wife has nothing to do with any of our investments. I think she knows where most of them are. Although there is a piece of paper that has like all the passwords and stuff written down, but I don't know. I'm just wondering from your own experience, is there anything you can sort of share there? Very rarely do I run into a couple who are both enthusiastically interested in a portfolio or in investing. Usually if there are two people on the phone, it's one spouse dragging the other spouse into the conversation. Um, cause one person is very interested and the other is just, uh, just there because they spouse wants them there and they 
had better be there and listen to this stuff. But um, uh, do I find that the outcome is different? Well, I'll tell you what's really more disconcerting is not when they're both there, it's when, when not one isn't there. Well, I'll ask, hey, is your husband or your wife or significant other, whatever you have, um, joining us today? And if the answer is no, he or she is out doing whatever he or she does, uh, I'll ask. I said, well, are they at all interested in this? And normally the answer no, I have no interest whatsoever. Well, that tells me something. That's important information for me as an advisor. I mean, that registers right away because now I have to be very careful. I'm dealing with a person here who does everything and the other person has completely disinterested, not interested at all. But this person I'm dealing with could die tomorrow or die next year. So we have that conversation. Hey, look, I, I, you know, I, I know you like factor investing and all that's pretty cool, right? Maybe we want to do some of this or some of that. You think that's all pretty cool, but what about your spouse? I mean, what's going to happen if you died? You know, let's not do that. Let's just be as simple as you can possibly be. And oh, by the way, uh, you know, something happened to you. Just make sure he or she just leaves everything just the way it is and calls me, which never happens. Never, never happens, ever. Uh, I, in my 35 some odd years of doing this, anytime one spouse says, well, we're not going to have you manage your money or we're not going to hire you right now, but when I die, my better half is supposed to call you. That's, I have never received one call ever. So that means everybody has a very long lifespan if they talk with me. But um, so I don't know if, uh, if this helps, but it does make a difference when the, you have a disinterested spouse. And I have to be, excuse me, I have to be very direct with the other person I'm speaking with and saying, you have to set this up so that if you died, somebody in your family can pick it up and know what it is. Either it's your spouse or it's your children or somebody has to be able to look at this and go, oh, I, I can understand this. That's what you, and I don't care whether you like, you know, uh, small gap value, or I don't care if you like real estate, or I don't care if you like this or that. We're not going that direction. There are more important things here on the table. And let's, let's do this instead. And generally they, they get that. They get it. Well, it would, it would seem to me that the people that are implementing your strategies, when that time comes and somebody else needs to look at the portfolio, it's going to be simple. If they've done it correctly, it's still going to be simple and easy to understand. Somebody's going to be able to look at it. It's not going to be, you know, 20 million holdings. And what is this? What is that? It's going to be the simple portfolio, you know, strategy that, you know, you outline for them. Uh, that, that's the idea. That, that is the idea. It's whether it's a son or a daughter or whomever, or a friend who's the executor of the estate, they look at this and hopefully they have enough smarts to go, oh, this is pretty darn simple. Which at that point, the other, the, the, the spouse would say, yeah, you know, and I remember John or Jane, whomever was that I was working with that died said, don't do anything with this. Just leave it alone. I remember them saying that there's a higher probability they will. Um, and then again, there's a high probability that somebody from one of the brokerage firms is going to show up at the funeral and, you know, a long lost cousin. <laughs> Who's an annuity salesman or something? <laughs> you just can't get away from that. I, you know. Um, I was going to ask you about something in your portfolio that you might hold that would be like unique that people might not um, uh, think of you. Is there anything that you do hold that you know, it, it, whether, whether it's outside of this sort of core investment portfolio or maybe even in it? Is there anything that you can think of that's a little bit more unique to your approach? Sure. And, and I talked about the I-bonds, which I don't think is that unique anymore. Uh, I do hold a small position in preferred stock. And this is a fixed income position. I, I look at my fixed income side of my portfolio and there's a certain percentage of it that I'm never going to sell. I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm never going to need it for any, uh, you know, any emergency or contingency or reserve fund. It's not going to be used for any kind of a distribution and type of retirement. I mean, it's a, this is long-term fixed income that 
is never going to get sold out of the portfolio. And I've been in the preferred stock market for 30 years. Um, mostly financial companies, mostly because they have to be in the preferred area because they can't issue debt because they're banks. They can't issue equity because they don't want to dilute shareholder earnings. So they issue preferred stock. Uh, so this is a, a core, deep, deep core fixed income holding. And, uh, it is, uh, 10% of my total portfolio. So it's, you know, remember I said, I might go up to 80% equity, 20% fixed income. This is 10% of the 20 would be this. It's not there yet, but it might get there. And, um, it, it's a, it's a high yielding fixed income asset that very few people have in their portfolio and very few people follow. There are certain tax advantages to having preferred stock in your taxable portfolio. I use an index fund and uh, the index fund is the, the ticker is P F F D Papa Foxtrot Foxtrot Delta P F F D. That's the one that I use. And, uh, you know, when I buy it, I, it's always yielding 6%. Um, it's, I don't know if it's yielding 6% now, but last time I bought it, it was yielding 6%. So that's the unusual holding that I have. Just one more question for me before I hand it back over to Jack. And I, um, you had mentioned that you had sold your company, um, I don't know, maybe it was it five years ago, something like that. Yeah. Did that, ch you know, the answer might be like, no, but did that change your mindset as a investor when you had that liquidity event? Or was it just like, you know, the you obviously were financially rewarded. So maybe it made your financial situation more secure. It made retirement more secure, but I mean, did it, did anything else change with your sort of investing mindset once that happened? I don't think it did. Uh, I just had more money to put into the same strategy. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, tax wise, I had to be careful. You know, taxes are funny, right? I mean, investing is simple. Taxes make it much, much harder. And so I had to think about long term, not only where I am now and still working, but at age 70, when I stop working and I'm going to get social security. You know, how, 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 what I invest in now and where it is, my asset location, where I put things are going to affect my taxes, Medicare Irma, which is how much you pay for Medicare, net investment income tax, all of this stuff. So I did do much more thinking about taxes than I did about, uh, the actual allocation. I was pretty sure what I was going to, you know, invest in. And that's, that's what I've done. As we get towards the end of these interviews, we always like to ask about this idea that not all investments are great investments financially. And so the example I always give for me is I own a racing sailboat. And so a racing sailboat is just an atrocious investment. It's, it's just, you basically might as well just take money and just dump the money into the racing sailboat. <laughs> but like, I've gotten a lot of benefits in my life. You know, it's, it's a lot of fun. I can go out there with my friends on a Wednesday night and have a beer and, you know, do a race. And so it's, it's caused me a lot. It's gotten me a lot of enjoyment. And I'm wondering if there's anything in your life that's like that, where maybe it's not the greatest financial investment, but it's made a lot of sense for you anyway. Not now, not anymore. I mean, I had a lot of those, no, no racing sailboats, but I had my share of airplanes and, uh, time shares, uh, early on Salvador Dali prints that turned out to be fake. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff like that. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing back in the day, you know? I mean, so. Um, now again, I, I, I think I've gotten rid of most of, I can't think of anything that, uh, that I have that falls into that category anymore. Thank God. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. We've had, I think, I believe two Marines on the podcast between you and Wes, and you both gave the exact same answer, which is, which is effectively no, um, you know, we don't have anything like that that we do. Um, so there must be some sort of common line there. I don't know. I don't know. Rick, we like to ask all of our guests the following standard closing question. And that is, if you could teach one lesson to your average investor around what you've learned from building your personal portfolio, what would that be? Simpler, the better. Honestly, if you can do it with two funds, do it with two funds. 
I mean, you don't need any more than a balanced index fund and a tax deferred portfolio. And then in your taxable portfolio, if you're going to have you know, have stock in there, total stock market, total international, and a you know a something for a reserve fund of some sort. But I mean, the absolute simpler you make it, the better it is for you, the better it is for your family, the cheaper it is, the less taxing it is, and the more time you have to spend doing the things that you enjoy doing, which is not this. Uh, you know, <laughs> I hate to say it, but uh, um, it it it. This is a necessity. Um, I, I don't know if I, you know, I could have been an airline pilot, but I decided to do this instead. I'm glad I did it. Uh, it was a really good exercise. But at some point in my life, I'm going to not want to have to think about any of this anymore. I don't know when that is. Like I said, I'm in my 70s, I want to rewrite some books and all of that. Maybe it'd be in my 80s. I don't know. But there's got to be more enjoyable things to do than this. <laughs> All right, Rick. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us and sharing your wisdom and knowledge. If people want to learn more about um, you, your books, the strategies we've talked about, um, follow you on Twitter. Where can they go? Well, my website is rickferry.com. Pretty simple, right? Try to keep things simple. And just go there and there'll be my books, my podcast, and whatever else I'm doing, it'll go up on rickferry.com. And uh, we're doing a conference, by the way. The Bogleheads are doing a conference in a couple of months in Chicago. We're doing a lot of work on that. I'm also the president of the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy. Uh, and so we are we're doing a lot of work there, a lot of good work to help a lot of uh, people. So spend a lot of time doing that. But my website is rickferry.com. Great. Thank you very much, Rick. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. <laughs>